Hello, and welcome to SLP Full Disclosure. I am your host, Jennifer Martin, and joining me is my crazy fun sidekick, Jonathan Carey. (laughs) Hello. Uh... (laughs) I think maybe less of the fun and more on the crazy. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe this week. Yeah. (laughs) Next week, maybe more fun. Yeah. Yeah. I'll take what I can get. Well, I, I think our guests would be able to tell if I'm really crazy or not, though. Well, it, it wouldn't. It, it, it doesn't take a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot of us could tell. No. And I mean that in the best way possible because, uh, because I do. I like your personality. So whatever it's called, I'll take it. <laughs> so, but one of the things that we are going to talk about today is, I think, extremely interesting, and therefore I know that you all will also, um, is just re-entry into the world after this crazy year plus that we've had, and also what are some things that we can do to help ourselves with it. So vicarious resilience is another term that we're going to talk about. And Jonathan, what is your on a one to 10, 10 being, I cannot wait for life to resume. One being, I want it to stay this way forever. Where are you at? Uh, I would say I'm a solid five, you know, okay. but mostly because my life didn't change a whole lot mm. with, you know, the pandemic. Cause I'm more of an introverted person, but mm-hmm. definitely still love my interaction with people. But I'd say what brought it down from a higher rating was going to the airport recently and it Mm. seeming like it was like the holidays for traveling of how many people there were there. And I'm like, I could do with the sparse airports of uh, Mm -hmm. earlier. (laughs) Yeah, that's for sure. I, mine is, I would have said a year ago, a 10, I can't wait, I can't wait. And it's interesting because over time I am now, feeling like a strong eight because I don't want everything to resume, Mm -hmm. but I want something. So what's the one thing that you don't want to resume or that you do, you can choose. Um, I think I had said yes to too many things and was part of too many groups and activities and whatnot. And even though I liked them, it was just too many of them. Mm -hmm. So that's, I'm happy that I can now say, oh, I don't have to continue some of those things and I can just continue the things that I really want. And then I also know that I can say no and and the world is going to continue to turn. All right. So let me tell you about our guest today who is going to be a wealth of knowledge in so many of the areas that we just talked about. So Emily McNeil is with us today and she, what hasn't Emily done? But I'm going to at least just name some of the things that she's done because she's pretty incredible. She is the owner of the Mariposa Center for Infant, Child, and Family Enrichment. She is an early childhood and family therapist and specializes in infant mental health, maternal, pre- and perinatal mental health, trauma, adoption, foster care, and developmental delay. She received her Master's of Arts degree in Somatic Counseling Psychology with a concentration in Dance Movement Therapy from Naropa University, and she is also a registered Dance Movement Therapist and a licensed professional counselor. In addition to that, she is also a certified infant massage instructor and holds advanced training in EMDR. And she co-founded the Adams County NICU Task Force and team to help improve the support and therapeutic services premature and medically fragile babies and their families receive post-discharge. And she's worked with children and families for over 13 years. So she is a wealth of knowledge. And we are so happy to have Emily McNeil join us today. So welcome, Emily McNeil, one of my favorite people in the whole wide world. Hi, Jennifer. It's good to see you over recording in person in virtual land. <laughs> I know. We used to see each other in person mm-hmm. in in the in the in flesh, the flesh. <laughs> and <laughs> and now it's been so long that um you know, I'm not going to show you what I'm wearing from the waist down oh, yeah. and you don't have to show me. So it's, you know, <laughs> what is it? B- business on top, party on the bottom. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> So I know we used to get to see each other at least once a month. Yeah. And so I, but I will take what I can get. Mm-hmm. If this is it, I will take it. And I'm, I'm grateful that we have cameras. Yeah. Well, I love that we have to schedule a podcast in order to see each other too. So that was really clever on your it, part. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> 
Exactly. Exactly. I was like, come on, come on. <laughs> well, and you are, have been, this is your second time on this podcast. Mm-hmm. And I'm so grateful that you said yes again, <laughs> because um, your timing of this podcast you, you've been on my mind a lot during this pandemic. <laughs> I'm sure you've been on a lot of people's <laughs> minds during this pandemic and a lot of calls from parents and people saying help. Mm-hmm. But um, you've really been on my mind a lot. And I'm really looking forward to this conversation where we're going to be able to talk about, okay, and I always feel like I'm going to miss this, vicarious resilience. Yes. Resilience. Yes. Does not does not roll off the tongue. Does not no. <laughs> <laughs> and um, re-entry anxiety, and it is very funny to me that since we kind of talked about discussing this in the podcast, I have had so many conversations with people that they have brought up to me about this exact topic. Oh, like, interesting. I don't know how I feel about entering real world again. So mm-hmm. it's like, okay, this is perfect timing. Mm-hmm. So. I'm really glad that we're going to be able to have this conversation today. Yeah. Yeah, me too, because I I honestly think in the larger world, it's something that people are not talking about. You know, we're mostly hearing celebration. We're mostly hearing Mm -hmm. um, relief. And all of that is true. Um, But we can't forget that there's another side to the story for a lot of people, Um People of all kinds, right? People who've experienced a loss, people may, who may have struggled with anxiety before the pandemic, people who, um, you know, may have really suffered with lack of housing or losing their jobs or, you know, job insecurity, um, people who are still immunocompromised, you know, maybe they have a medical condition or a child with a medical condition um, and, and they, you know, just don't feel quite certain um, about what they're supposed to do and what it's supposed to feel like as um, at least in some parts of the United States, you know, things start to open up again. Yeah. I, everything you said are things that I've thought about. And you know what else too, that has been something that I've thought a lot about during this time, because I personally have felt this is that, wow, if you, you talk about feeling vulnerable mm-hmm. in, in a way that you just probably, many people probably haven't before. It's like, oh, sometimes really bad things will happen and there's nothing anybody can do about it. And so yeah. it definitely is a different sense of nobody can can make this better right now mm-hmm. and nobody has the answers. And it was definitely moments where I'm thinking, wow, most times in life, it, things bad things happen. You think, well, somebody will have the answer. Somebody will know what to do. And this is that one time where I thought, nobody knows. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. Right. And I, I, think, I think that that really hit a lot of people in the last year. And, and I think there's a question for a lot of folks, like, and, and do, even though it's a year and change later, do we still, do we know, <laughs> um, you know, are these, are these, um, re-entry plans, um, how certain can we be about them? And, you know, and I've seen that a lot, um, and heard that a lot with, um, vulnerable clients, um, that maybe have experienced, ups, really significant and maybe traumatic ups and downs in their lives um, up until this point. And so they already have difficulty trusting and feeling like they have control over over anything. Um, And then I've also seen and heard that in people who didn't have that you know, pre-pandemic experience um, where the world just went topsy-turvy overnight and it feels difficult to trust the re-entry because that also felt like it happened overnight. Um, yeah. So it was, you know, very quick and not a lot of time for, for people to plan. Um, and that's been that's been difficult, I think, for some. Yeah, and also feeling like, it's half the time. Did I get the memo? Like now this is happening. Now this is right. the way people are operating. Now this right. is, the, it's always feeling like you just never really got the, the map. I, that's why I feel half the time I go to the store. I'm mm-hmm. like, what's the protocol now? What am I supposed to be doing? Right. So it's, well, yeah. I, I think definitely for, for, for providers, you know, for, for speech therapists and, mm-hmm. and mental health providers, you know, we don't fall into one of the standard categories. You know, we don't necessarily fall into a medical professional category. We don't fall into, um, you know, a school-based category necessarily. You know, if we're doing home visitation or 
you know, telehealth, home visitation um, over the last year. And so it's been really tricky to figure out which protocol to adhere to, which one we're supposed to follow and listen to. And, you know, what I've, what I've seen personally and what I've talked to so many colleagues about is that, you know, the local guidelines are different than the state guidelines are different from the federal guidelines. Um, and then also there's my personal feelings too. And then having to mesh all of that with with serving a clientele um, that may have a very different perspective about the pandemic, it can be so very, very stressful for providers to figure out how to navigate um, not only personally, right, but professionally. And sometimes how they've been having to show up professionally is very different than what they would have chosen for themselves personally. Yeah, and the layers that come with that because so many. Just this is an example just from this week. So a, a baby that I'm working with who's medically fragile, I mm-hmm. was talking doing a telehealth visit and I said, "Okay, I feel like I would be ready to come to your home and and see this this child." And but then that he's got other people that come into the house, other medical professionals and a nurse and different therapists. And so I'm thinking, are you okay with that? And then they said, yes. And I said, well, is the nurse okay with that? Is this person okay with that? And I feel like there's mm-hmm. just so many layers of, again, as a therapist of any kind, a professional working with families and children, it's there's a lot to navigate. So yeah, it's not just us, them, it's all the other layers that you have to take into consideration. Yeah. And you know, it's interesting. Um, a family that I work with when, um, in Colorado, the, the, um, restrictions loosened a little bit in the Mm -hmm. spring, they actually said to me in one of our, our meetings together, um, well, now we have to be scared again because our child was, or their child, it was, is immunocompromised. Um, and when, when, when the mask restrictions were lifted, they said, well, now we have to be scared again because there will be more germs floating through the air. Mm -hmm. She could be exposed to something. And so they actually felt when the mask restrictions were lifted in Colorado, they, they hunkered down again. They, you know, started to restrict their activity again because they were afraid that, you know, with people not wearing masks, that she would be more susceptible to, um, to germs and illnesses. They felt very protected where, when the larger community was wearing uh, a mask. And obviously she's a, a young child and, you know, not able to be vaccinated at this point. And, um, and so that was, that was a really interesting conversation that I had with them, you know, that for them, loosening the restrictions created a, a, not just anxiety, but an intense fear that their child was going to be, you know, could, could get exposed to something that could, could really harm her. Yeah. And, and, and that, mm-hmm. again, that's, that's that vulnerability piece where it's like everything is just, you're exposed wide open and all the things you fear mm-hmm. most, it's right there in your face. So, and I yeah. know I want to talk just about, because I hadn't really heard this term re-entry anxiety until you brought it up. And so, mm-hmm. and I know just like you said, there's this desire of I just want to get back to normal. I just want to get back to normal. And so, so many questions mm-hmm. like, well, what does that look like now? Is that, it's probably not mm-hmm. going to be the same normal that was before mm-hmm. these, it's the new normal. Um, and so mm-hmm. that's another thing I keep hearing. Talk a little bit about just this term re-entry anxiety and what does it mean? It refers to, you know, this, this sense that the pandemic or the message really that the pandemic is over. Um, in the United States or in, in most parts of the United States or mm, with for most people and um, and we're you know we're getting guidelines on all of those different levels that that we just talked about you know a few minutes ago that um, we can in essence go back to normal <clears throat> that we don't have the same restrictions that we had during the pandemic um, and that there's less risk to to people in in contracting COVID-19. Um, and so, you know, for some people that feels wonderful, that feels like a celebration, it feels like a relief. And for other people that can create um, 
feelings of anxiety or trepidation or even depression and sadness, um, feeling confused, feeling like I'm not really sure where I stand um, because the last year has been so difficult, something that none of us could really ever imagine. And, um, and now having to pivot back to the new, new, new normal, you know, there've been mm-hmm. so many iterations of this over the last <laughs> year and version? a half, um, which version, right? It's, it's two point very confusing what? to people. Yeah. <laughs> right. I, I've lost track. Yeah. Um, you know, and particularly for people who may have had a predisposition to anxiety before or depression before or um, traumatic stress, or like we, we've talked about, you know, people who may have a medical condition that still puts them in a, you know, in a uh, vulnerable position um, with their health. All of those things can create a certain level of anxiety. Um, and I've, you know, I've heard too, there's a, there's sort of a future oriented layer of like, how long will this last? Um, is this really over? Um, I've heard people bring in the ideas of privilege into this. Well, it's over quote unquote for us, maybe in the, some parts of the United States, but not in the rest of the world. And so should I be more cautious so that I I can have this sort of human focus, this social justice focus on the pandemic and not just think about my own personal comfort. Like, oh, I really want to go have coffee with that friend and I can, um, you know, should they be thinking about um, the impact on, you know, the larger the larger world, you know, this sort of human community that we have and how do we take care of each other, even if we're not in the same country um, because the pandemic is still very real for a lot of people in other parts of, of the world. We'll be right back to our interview. We just want to take a brief moment to shout out the company that makes this show possible, Med Travelers. If you are a therapist interested in traveling, visit medtravelers.com to explore the amazing benefits that Med Travelers has to offer featuring short and long-term contract opportunities at leading facilities across the country with higher earning potential, W-2 employee status, and a flexible schedule, Med Travelers is your advocate for career success. Visit medtravelers.com to begin your travel adventure today. And now back to the show. Yeah, and you just touched on so many things that I, I think are just so very important is that I think part of this anxiety is that it's really, you feel like this protective nature. I want to take care of myself and and those that I love, but then you're right. There is Mm -hmm. this bigger world and the things that may seem important to me and that I value, you know, I want to go get coffee versus I can't leave the house because I'm finishing chemo treatments and I can't go to work and I can't pay my bills. And so those are two very different camps. Right. They are two very different camps. And, you know, we're also experiencing a lot of social pressure these days, too. Um, You know, and I I felt it myself and I've definitely heard a lot of other people say, um, well, I'm going to do what I see my community do Um, because I'm not sure. Right. And so that's coming from a place of Mm reentry anxiety. I don't know what the right thing to do is right now, but I'll make my decision based on what I observe in my larger social group or community. So if I go to a place and I don't know what the protocol is on masking and hugging and social distancing or whatever that might be, I'll see what everybody else is doing and then that's what I'll do. Um, That may not always be the wisest decision, but as social creatures, that's what, um, that's what a lot of us are doing is we're basing the decision off of what we observe, you know, a larger, um, group of people doing as well. And so it becomes really difficult to kind of make your own decision during this time and kind of hold on to what feels right to you. Um, if you're observing the larger community do something different. Yeah, and I'm sure it's very brainstem oriented where it's this protective mechanism where, okay, if you see everybody running one direction, you're going to run with them and not go the other direction. Even, you right. know, well, I, I really don't right. feel like I should go that way, but it's probably a lot of preservation built into that Absolutely. as well. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and there's been so much... Um, 
really external conflict over some of the elements of the pandemic. And so I think there's a piece of where people want to avoid that conflict. And so, gosh, if they want to wear a mask, but they're in a community that's not wearing a mask, um, they want to avoid the questions and they want to avoid the comments. They want to avoid the explanation. And so they won't wear a mask as well Um, because, you know, it's been very heated and very, very uncomfortable, you know, in a lot of situations for for some people. I hadn't noticed that. (laughs) This is why I'm like, I am off all social media. I was like, I can't. Not I don't yeah. <laughs> like don't talk to me about it. I don't want to read anything. Uh, and one group mm-hmm. I really have been thinking a lot about, and pretty much everybody listening to this probably works with this population in some way, shape, or form, are children. And it's one thing as mm-hmm. an adult with decent-ish coping skills. Speaking personally, <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> depends on the day. Mm-hmm. But I'm thinking a lot about our kids, and I just was listening to a mother, another mother talk and say, well, I don't know what we're going to do about the fall going back into school because if they're not vaccinated and you say you don't want to, then they still have to wear a mask. And so then they stand out. And so there's layers Mm -hmm. within that as well. What are you seeing with re-entry anxiety in our youth, our, the children? Yeah. Um, You know, I think it's actually pretty parallel to what you see in the adult population. And I think that's probably because children mirror, you know, their, their grownups, right. And and what they see. And so, you know, there, there are children who are um, in that camp of like, hooray celebration, or, you know, just feel so relieved to be able to play with their friends and, and hang out and not wear a mask and go to summer camp and do a lot of the things that they weren't able to do um, last year. And there is this large group of kids that we're not talking about um, who are, you know, quite anxious. And I I feel like we see it, well, often, you know, we see um, behaviors on a continuum, right? And so we see the, the, on one end of the continuum, the really obvious, um, you know, kiddos who who may be having panic attacks or meltdowns, um, you know, resistance to do things. And then on the other side of the continuum, you see the kids who are not speaking about their anxiety. Um, you will see it more in their their nonverbal behaviors, like they hide behind mom, right, when they see somebody maybe for the first time. Or, you know, they're the one kid in the group of 30 kids running around at the park who still has their mask on. Um, or, you know, they're the you're, you're talking to them and... It, you also, you have to ask them, right? If they're, if they're a little bit older and they can speak to it, you know, because a lot of kids aren't talking about it. And so what I found is as an adult, I have to say really specifically, um, how do you feel about not wearing your mask? Or how do you feel about going back to school next year? How do you feel about giving me a hug? Um, and you know, you will see those quiet kiddos sort of shake their head and like, Mm-mm, I don't want to do that. Um, and so we have to pay attention to both ends of the continuum. You know, the kiddos who are really expressive about their their stress right now and the kiddos who may not be speaking about it. And so I would encourage all all grown-ups listening who, you know, know a child and who work with a child to not just assume that the reentry is is um, a celebration for them, you know, and to ask them how they feel about it so that they have an opportunity to share that with you. Because what we know about anxiety is when we don't talk about it, when we don't put it out there, what it does inside of us, and this is sort of a, you know, a a visual metaphor is that it just festers and builds, um, and it grows and gets bigger. It doesn't have anywhere to go. Um, and so if we can talk about it, you know, a child can talk about it to, to, a um, a supportive adult who can validate their feelings instead of saying like, Oh, you don't have anything to worry 
worry about. It's fine. But you, you know, saying something, you know, instead, like, gosh, you know, it can feel really scary to, um, to give somebody a hug after not hugging them for a year and a half or to go back to school or to, you know, to maybe get sick because that's another Mm -hmm. fear that I've seen children have is, you know, a lot of kiddos haven't been sick in a year and a half if they didn't Mm -hmm. contract COVID. Um, and if they were already, you know, healthy kiddos without an, um, uh, a medical difficulty. And so, you know, some kiddos are afraid to get the sniffles, um, or allergies during the summertime. You know, I've seen that too, like, oh, I'm sneezing. What does that mean? Um, and so, you know, as adults, we really have to reassure them and give them positive reinforcement for expressing their feelings. Um, and then gently shift into, and, you know, we can, we can go there whenever you're ready, Jennifer, but, but gently shift into coping skills for the anxiety too. Um, and that's true for the kids and it's true for the adults too. Yeah. I just found myself the other day with my daughter has horrible allergies and feeling like I had to explain to everybody around me on her behalf that she had the, no, she's got allergies. Oh, by the way, she's got allergies. <laughs> I mean, like I was talking, telling strangers, you know, she has allergies and I'm thinking, She's feeling pretty good about it, but my behaviors and what I'm doing probably isn't helping Mm -hmm. the situation. Mm -hmm. So with that, on that note, what do you recommend? um, And I definitely do want to touch on coping skills because, you know, those Mm -hmm. are my favorite, some of my favorite skills. Um, But (laughs) what do you, because I feel like sometimes that kids are looking to us as professionals or parents or just as adults to say, oh, look, you are calm, cool, and collected about this. Therefore, I should feel that way too. But I do think there's this this place of wanting to be really honest with them and say, I'm nervous too. And I'm, this mm-hmm. is, I'm scared about this. But what do you recommend is that balance of not like showing, I feel these way, these things too, and it's normal and it's okay versus <laughs> we're all going to die. You know, what's the mm-hmm. happy medium between mm-hmm. that? Yeah, I mean, I I think the happy medium is, um, okay, so even if an adult doesn't share the same reentry anxiety that a child might, they can still relate in some fashion, right? Because every single person on the planet has been anxious or nervous about something or has worried about something, right? And so, you know, relating to that child, you know, I yeah, I understand um, that you feel anxious right now. I get that. I've been anxious too before in my life or maybe right now. Um, you don't have to offer a ton of details unless they press, right? Unless they say, well, what makes you anxious? And then you could say, um, something, you know, again, keep it very developmentally appropriate, but, um, sometimes not wearing my mask after wearing it for a year and a half makes me a little anxious. Or you could say sometimes when I'm late for work, that makes me a little anxious. Um, and so you can, you can pick and choose, um, the example that you're going to give, um, especially when you're having these conversations, you want to stay grounded. And so if it feels too close to pick a real time example of your own worries, pick something else that's happened in the past, um, that you feel a little bit more removed from, that's not going to create anxiety for you in that moment. And then, shift the conversation to when I felt anxious or when I feel anxious, these are the things I do to help myself feel better. Um, what, what, what do you think would help you feel better? And if you're working with a very young child, you would be having these conversations with the parents. Um, what do you notice when, um, when she gets upset or anxious or resistant to going out in the world or whatever it might be? Um, and what helps her to soothe? Um, what have you found to be effective in the past? Um, what hasn't worked? And so you can tailor these conversations based on, you know, whether you're working with the parent directly or or, or more with the child. Um, but you can start generating those conversations about coping skills and, um, you know, offering some of your own ideas, but also seeing what works for them because it's a very individualistic process. Well, and I really like um, that. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. No, I was just, yeah. I was just going to tie in this idea yeah. of vicarious resilience too, yeah. as, as a coping skill. And so this is this coping skill that I think we all have and we don't realize we have it. 
Um, and, you know, I think Jennifer, the last time we talked on the podcast, we were talking about secondary trauma mm-hmm. and, um, and vicarious trauma, they're interchangeable terms. And so this time, you know, it feels important to talk about this, this concept of vicarious resilience. So just like in secondary trauma, where we can absorb the stress and trauma of other people on a, on a brain-based level, we can also absorb the resilience that we have observed in the last year and a half from other people. And that might be resilience um, that we've observed in friends and family and our direct community. It also might be on a worldwide level. You know, the thing that jumps out to me as a as an example of vicarious resilience, you know, for those who might remember early in the pandemic um, last or two springs ago now, um, you know, at eight o'clock all over the world, mm-hmm. people would ring bells and shout out their door and have this moment of intentional, um, positive energy for the first responders and the healthcare workers that were, that were supporting. And they were, those people were demonstrating their resilience. And then all of the other people around who were cheering and celebrating were saying, we see your resilience. And that means a lot to us. And so it was a way for us to really explicitly, um, sit in that space of vicarious resilience. And there have been so many other, you know, situations between then and now, um, I'm sure for all of us where we have observed some, um, some strength and maybe we don't feel that way. We feel anxious, we feel worried, but we can observe and and really take in on a brain-based level, the resilience of other people as a way to cope with this re-entry anxiety. Yeah. And this is, again, the first time I had heard this term. So this is, this is not a new concept or, or is it like, has this kind of, okay, so this is, it's just kind of come back around with, with our current situation. Um, the idea of vicarious resilience, perhaps I'm not hearing it on a, on a wider, you know, Mm -hmm. media, um, kind of a level. I think it's something you and I are talking about today. Um, but it's something that as a, as a trauma therapist Mm -hmm. is really important for me as a provider, because sometimes the work can feel so heavy. Um, and I, you know, I'm an empathetic person. You're an empathetic person. Most, most people who work with humans have a great deal of empathy and sometimes you know feeling all of that can can be overwhelming it can feel so heavy and so i have to remember for myself to also um remember the successes remember the growth remember the strength remember that the reason someone survived this difficult thing was because they had this resilience already. And they had these protective factors that were really fostered in them so that they could, um, they could get through, you know, a difficulty in their life. Yeah. And is this something that you feel like when you tying this back to being a coping mechanism, when you're personally in this situation, or when you're working with a child where you're trying to show them you can overcome this, this person overcame this, is it, do you yourself seek out these things or do you feel like it's more of, it's not intentional and all of a sudden you'll read about somebody that you think, oh, wow, look at how resilient they were. How can I apply some of that? Or is it a combination of both? Yeah, it's definitely a both and. Um, I think the having an opportunity to observe resilience is really important. And, you know, we know that not everybody we work with, they do. Um, We know that sometimes um, other circumstances in life um, and an environment get in the way of of people having opportunities to observe resilience in others. Um, And so we want to be mindful of of the privilege that may be um, related to to that. Um, But it's on the on the and side, the both and piece, it's really important the more we as as a community talk about this idea of vicarious resilience, 
Will it raise folks' awareness to also look for it and have a mindful experience and know that it doesn't have to be just within my community? Can it be um, a little bit more removed? Can it be something that I've seen on on the news or on television or a story that I read? Um, does it have to happen within my my household? You know, can it be in my in my workplace in my um, in my school. And, you know, obviously when people were so isolated, it may have felt harder to find, but I would encourage people to start looking for it now, you know, especially if they are feeling that reentry anxiety. Um, you know, what are some strengths out there that really align and inspire me that I can sort of take pieces of, um, and ground myself with if I'm feeling worried about something? Yeah, I am already thinking about, I think just naturally we do this as humans and try to glob on to those, but you're right. Mm -hmm. There's sometimes it's not right in front of your face and it, it does come with a certain sense of privilege of having the having those people in your environment that you can look at as being really resilient, resilient and understanding mm -hmm. even that they were resilient and how that happened. So when you're thinking about getting, you know, I'm thinking just even before the fall season, fall starts and, and kids going back to school. And again, mm -hmm. whether it's a child, mm -hmm. you know, a child you work with, how do you use this vicarious resilience? What would be an example of how you would work with a child who's anxious with this resilience to help them feel better about going back to school in fall? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, depending on the age, it would vary a little bit, but I think, um, you know, we would start to have conversations about um, either qualities within them, and most of the time it would be qualities within them, even if you're asking about external qualities, you know, you want, you, you understand that when kids speak about things, they're, they're typically talking about, you know, themselves. And so, you know, qualities within them or qualities that they admire in other people. Um, and, a, you know, it could be a really lovely um, intervention and, you know, all of the, the people listening, I know are very creative um, professionals to um, cre help create a narrative around, um, you know, and we, some people call it a social story. Some people call it narrative therapy. Um, you know, it doesn't, doesn't really matter, but to create a narrative around <clears throat> what those, um, what those strengths could be and how that child could use them. Then could there be opportunities to practice, you know, either in a clinic or in a home-based setting or in a community. Um, and so maybe brave, maybe brave is, is the quality that this child is really latching onto. And so, you know, a provider could ask that child, um, how have you been brave? And you could just leave it like that. You could say, how have you been brave in the pandemic? If it feels really specific, um, or tell me about a time you were brave. Um, and then you could also, you know, talk to the child about other people, other instances of brave that they've seen. Um, tell me about a time when your mommy was brave or when your teacher was brave or when your kitty cat was brave. Um, and you know, you could create art with that. They could draw it out. Um, if the verbal is too difficult, um, they can, um, play it out. If your, your primary mode is, is play. Um, so there are a lot of ways for them to express that. And, you know, sometimes in, in our clinic, um, we've turned that into a book for the kiddos and we've illustrated it and we've bound it. And then it becomes something that the caregiver can use at home, especially during those transition times, like going back to school for example, or going to a doctor's visit or getting on an airplane for the first time, um, you know, in a long time. So um, I, I think that's where I would start, you know, with a lot of kiddos. And then you can adapt it um, pretty easily based on how old they are or what their level of cognition might be. Yeah. I'm thinking even for older kids, there's some really great athlete stories out there or yeah. people in that genre that it's like they overcame this horrific injury to then bounce back mm -hmm. and then to become even better or do something different that was equally great. So you're exactly right. Mm -hmm. I think you can find those examples that would apply to any age group. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I do think, you know, there has been a, um, 
One of the silver linings of the last year and a half is that there has been more conversation on a collective level around mental health and around struggle. Mm -hmm. And so we don't want to give the impression that um, as long as you're brave, nothing will happen, right? And and you will be okay. And we also don't want to give the impression that brave is the right way to be. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, we want to be able to sort of round out all of those experiences and validate and normalize um, and and use brave as a coping skill, but not send the message that you should only be brave, Um, that being scared is not okay, because being scared is actually as intelligent of an emotional response as being brave is. Um, And so we want to make sure that we're, we're validating all of those feelings in the children and in families that we work with. I am absolutely going to retain that and use that because I think that is such, I really love the way that you worded that, that it is being scared. I mean, so many times it's thought of as this negative emotion, but it's really a positive Mm -hmm. and crucial emotion for survival and life. We have to have it. It protects us. Yes. It protects us from danger. Yes. Um, and it actually helps us make really good choices. Mm-hmm. The, you know, where fear takes us over is when it becomes paralyzing yeah. and when it limits our ability to move forward. We should always listen to fear. We should always listen to worry, um, anxiety, nervousness, whatever word it is for, for that person. Uh, you know, a little bit, we should cue in, right? But if it becomes the loudest voice, if it, if it becomes the only voice that we're listening to, that's where we want to, you know, maybe seek professional help, um, talk about it to friends and family, supportive people. Um, remember this idea of vicarious resilience so that you can, you know, look toward, to w- look for ways that you can help yourself. Mm-hmm. Um yeah, so we have to pay attention to it, but it shouldn't be the only voice that we listen to. Yeah, I love that. It's like sit there, but don't live there. So exactly, <laughs> you yeah. use it for what it's meant to be used for, but don't let it, don't get stuck. And I would exactly. love to just touch on too something you said where, you know, I think about a lot of people, clinicians, therapists that have been absorbing from the families and children that they work with all these anxieties and worries and fears and then having their own, how do you as a professional use vicarious resilience? What does that look like for you? Um, that's a good question, Jennifer. Um, I think sometimes it, it, it looks like a very intentional practice. Um, because as we talked about before, sometimes the worries and stressors that I sit with and that we all sit with as providers and professionals can be heavy. And so I have to remind myself um, to also um, remember the strength. I have to remind myself that the reason that they got to where they they are now, even if it's been a really difficult journey, is because they had um, you know a lot of really wonderful qualities that got them through. Sometimes I have to, I, sometimes I can't see it myself. Um, and I might feel really, really bummed out. And that's when I go talk to my supportive teams, um, that I have, um, you know, wheedled my way into over the years or created, um, my, my BFF colleagues and Jennifer's one of them for sure. Um, And they're the ones who say, you know, who kind of give me that perspective, right? Um, And just being with really supportive colleagues who have my back, like no matter what, right? Like I can show up and I can be messy and I can be tearful and I can be anxious myself or grumpy or whatever that might be. But I have colleagues in my life who can um, support me and give me another perspective. That's really effective. Um, Breaks from it can be really helpful. So I'm pretty intentional coming home at the end of my day or logging off at the end of my day to then not expose myself to other, um, other media really that, um, are sort of feel traumatic to me. Um, you know, I, I will, you know, read silly books or watch silly things, or I'll play with my kids or, you know, cook or do something that, doesn't feel um, difficult because the work days can feel really heavy. Um, mm-hmm. And then sometimes magic happens. And so this past week, 
magic happened and I had to be open to it. I had a family that I hadn't seen in a very long time want to come visit with me at our clinic. And this is a little one that I worked with um, since she was about four and she's 13 now and I hadn't seen her in about three years. And, um, and they came and it was one of the most meaningful therapeutic experiences that I've had in a really long time, because the only reason they came was to celebrate how far this child has come in her, in her years and in, on her journey. And she, you know, she talked my ear off and we had such an awesome time together. And then at the end, this 13 year old girl, you know, in this, in this, you know, awkward adolescent phase in her life says to me with direct eye contact, Miss Emily, thank you so much. You've done so much for me. Um, and I wouldn't be here if it weren't for you. Mm -hmm. And I was like jaw dropped on the floor in shock. Wasn't expecting that. Um, how much, like, it was so sweet. And obviously I don't take all of the credit or even, I only maybe this much, right? Because she had a lot of other supports in her life. But the fact that at 13 years old, she could recognize that and that it was important for her family to come back to me so that I could see them in this really positive place, you know, whereas in other parts in their life, it had been, you know, more challenging. It was amazing. And it was, it was magic. I didn't put that out there. They circled back to me and they had this, um, awareness to really reflect on everything that they've been through and where they are now. And they wanted to celebrate that. And I was so grateful for that experience. Um, because sometimes we don't get to see that as providers. Mm -hmm. And so it was really special that, um, that I was, you know, able to see that in this, in this beautiful, um, young woman who, you know, I was just so proud of. And, um, yeah. And so that was, that was the magic. And sometimes we have to be open to that as well. Well, and the interesting thing about that is then you're able to take that vicarious resilience from her oh, yeah. because oh my it's gosh. like, you know, we can, we, we think it's probably, and I was just realizing, oh, wow, we can also get that from the kids and families that we're working with. Yes. Yes, that's exactly the point. And, you know, and so of course I, you know, finished my day on a high, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, and it's, it's stuck with me, you know, um, the, the rest of this week. And I think it will, I have a feeling, you know, it will stick with me forever. Um, it just feels like such a significant, like I could almost observe the moment in time. Like this mm -hmm. is really special. Um, hold on to this because you don't always get that. Um, and it was really, it was just amazing to see. I mean, it, it brings tears to my eyes just thinking about it. Yeah. Because I know yeah. even you and I have had many conversations about, I wonder what happened to so-and-so and you're just thinking, gosh, yeah. please let them be okay. But you just sometimes don't yeah. know. So that is a remarkable moment to know, mm -hmm. wow, you did, wow. you were able to demonstrate that resilience at a time when they needed it. And now they're giving it back to you. So when you right. feel burned out and you're feeling like you're struggling and am I doing, mm -hmm. is anything I'm doing actually <laughs> making a difference? It's like, then you yeah. get that back. So, right. I mean, I will always feel like that was such a gift that they gave me. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and maybe they didn't think about it like that. Um, and maybe it's not even appropriate for me to say to them, but, um, but it really does feel like that, that, that they gave me a gift by coming and, and visiting and, um, connecting and getting to hear about all of the amazing things that she's doing in her life and all of the plans that she has. And, you know, and remembering when I first met her, mm -hmm. um, and there was so much worry and concern and, you know, and she's just thriving. So that was really amazing. Oh, that is, that is a once, not probably for you once in a lifetime, but those are, those are great opportunities, great moments. Yeah. 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 And they don't happen to providers all the time. No. And so that's why I say we, when we see them, mm -hmm. you know, we have to be open to them. Um, and so I think that that's where raising awareness about something like vicarious resilience um, can be really helpful because mm -hmm. then we're a little bit more aware wake to those experiences of like, oh, this is that moment, right? I should really pay yes. attention. And in order to pay attention, 
you know, we have to do other things too. We have to take care of ourselves. You know, we have to practice those other, you know, self-care, um, routines that we, that we might let fall to the wayside. Um, but we have to be in a space where we can receive, right? Otherwise those opportunities will, they won't stick. You know, we won't pay attention to them. They'll sort of pass us by. Yeah. You're, it's, and it's so easy to let those things be the first that go. So it's, mm-hmm. you have to be so purposeful about maintaining, even if it's, I need to do a 15 minute walk. I need to get some, I need to not eat in front of my desk. I need to Mm-hmm. go get myself a decent cup of coffee, you know, whatever it is mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> or shower. Yeah. <laughs> or shower. I mean, self-care for a lot of us has, has really gotten flipped on its head, you know, mm-hmm. in the last year and a half. Um, and I, I, I get that I've lived that myself. Um, and so it can feel like a real challenge, especially if you're still working at home and you don't have childcare or, you know, maybe there there's job or housing insecurity or, you know, some other stressors, um, you know, and so I, I don't want to just say it's an easy yeah. fix for a lot of people. Um, but sometimes it is taking the shower and, and being mindful telling yourself, um, this is my self-care. I am yeah. taking a shower. I'm smelling my shampoo. I'm you know, making sure I'm drinking water today. Um, yeah. And, and practicing gratitude, especially during this time, you know, I think has been a saving grace for a lot of people yeah. when their self-care routines and their relationships have been so, um, fractured. Yes, absolutely. It's been a, I think a time of repair, mm-hmm. but also, <laughs> Some, some fractures that have taken place. Yeah, and what yeah. are your thoughts? Because as I'm thinking about vicarious resilience and how can I use this in my day to day and how can I give and receive in this realm and help my own children and the children I work with and the families, how do you balance with, because I have something I've really personally worked a lot more on is this thought of toxic positivity, which I realized that mm. I was doing and, you know, oh, it's going to be fine. This will be great. Oh, you know, tomorrow's a new day. There's always a silver lining. And it's like, sometimes mm. you just don't want to hear that. So I'm thinking, is there ever this fine line between demonstrating this resilience? Is it more of something that's shown and not spoken about? And how does it, do you ever find that it can bleed into that idea of toxic positivity and how to avoid that? Um, yes, it's definitely shown it. We, we observe vicarious resilience. Um, sometimes we hear about it, but in like a narrative story Mm -hmm. form, not in a buck up. Everything's going to be fine. <laughs> that's that's not resilience. That's not resilience. That is um, avoidance of truth, mm-hmm. really, um, because some people don't believe that everything's going to be fine. Um, and we really have to check ourselves when we when we give those messages, um, because they're, what are we saying when we're doing that? Are we avoiding emotion? Are we... Um, their emotion or our emotion, right? Are we ignoring, um, again, those dynamics of power and privilege? Um, It may be fine for me, but it might not be fine for you. Um, And so we have to be really careful um, when we say things like, buck up, it's going to be fine, um, that we're, and really be awake that we're probably ignoring another truth um, in, in those, in those moments. Um, And so, even, but, but here's the thing. If you're having a good day, you don't have to pretend that you're having a bad day. Um, and so you can, you can be okay, right? And, and have a happy, happy day or, or feel grounded or peaceful. Um, and also have an awareness that other people might not. Mm-hmm. Um, and so how do you, how do you model non-verbally your, inner resilience or your, you know, your positive headspace or whatever the phrase might be for you so that other people can absorb it. Because remember, Jennifer, when we talked about, you know, the secondary trauma Mm -hmm. several years ago, all of this is happening in our brains, right? Um, Sometimes when we're not even aware of it, right? So our brains, our limbic system in particular, is absorbing somebody else's emotional state. And so if I'm really grounded other people who are in relationship with me are going to pick up on that 
unconsciously. They're not even going to be aware of it necessarily. Um, if I'm really anxious or stressed or feeling really low, other people might pick up on that too. Now, sometimes folks have a protective barrier. If they're feeling very resilient and grounded themselves, I'm probably not going to bring them down all the way down if I'm in a rough day. But they'll have a sense of like, oh, what's going on with Emily? She seems a little bit off today. Um, and then they might leave my interaction, you know, questioning or confused or a little bit unsettled. Um, yes. So I would definitely say it's a very long-winded answer to say um, show, don't tell yeah. is so much more powerful. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I think that's so, I observe that often with my own children, if they're watching what I do much more than listening mm -hmm. to what I say. And so I think that's mm -hmm. with all children. Yeah. It's, it's, that's probably just, yeah. I, I'm sure I was the same way. I'm probably still that same way sometimes. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. well, and mm -hmm. I wanted to just touch mm -hmm. on too, cause I know I could keep you here all day and just tell me more, tell me more, but, um, you're a busy lady <laughs> and I know you have other things you need to do, but I wanted to just get a few more, what are some coping skills for our, we ourselves can use and that we can help our kids with, with that reentry anxiety piece too, as we're going into life, because mm -hmm. it's interesting. It's, this has been a, I've had a lot of time for self-reflection during this and I'm a very, I mm -hmm. love being with people. I get my energy from people. I, could schedule something with people every single night and it would be just fine. But it's been very interesting mm -hmm. over this time of being away from people that even as much as I loved it before, I'm feeling like I don't really want to go back to that level of being with people all the time. And that's been really an interesting concept for me personally. And I'm sure there's other people. So I'm thinking, mm -hmm. wow, if I didn't love it as much as I did in the, going into this, I may really feel like I don't ever need to see another person <laughs> you know, for a long time. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what coping skills can we ourselves use to decrease some of that anxiety and to feel, but also with that being said, set those boundaries for ourselves and helping our children also set those boundaries where it, you don't have to do exactly the things that we used to do. It's okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I, it's such a good question. I think a lot of us are thinking about this right now. Um, I think going slow and pacing oneself is really important. Um, and if, you know, if you're in a family talking to the other members in your household, um, you know, really intentionally having a conversation, what feels right for us right now? What doesn't feel right for us right now? Um, you know, does a play date with one other family feel good um, versus, you know, the birthday party at the jumpy place? Um, maybe we won't do that right now. And so there's a shared agreement with everyone in the household um, about what feels good. And, you know, and a lot of people, and I, I think this is actually a really great strategy, are using this summer to practice for what mm. the school year could look like. Um, and so they're getting out in little ways or they're setting boundaries you know, this summer, you know, so that they, when school, you know, for a lot of families, school just hits like full throttle, right? Um, and I, I think that that's the sense that a lot of people are getting even preparing for next school year now um, is, is that we're going to be all the way live and it's going to be great, right? And so how can families who maybe aren't there yet um, or maybe who never want to go there again, right? Because I've <laughs> yeah. also heard that too, that there's been a realignment of priorities for a lot of mm -hmm. people and they don't ever want to go back there. Um, so how can you use this summer to practice? What do I say yes to? And what do I say no to? Um, and how do I be confident in my decision? And maybe I made the wrong decision and can I change my mind? And so there's a little bit of flexibility, I think, for some families, um, for some folks this summer to play around a little bit with, um, their comfort level and trying to get out there in the, in the world a little bit and seeing what feels right and what, what might not feel right. Um, so that when, 
you know, for families when things are all the way live in late August, September, whenever you go back to school, um, there's been some precedent for this is how we're, we're going to do things. This is the rhythm of our family now at this stage um, in the in the COVID-19 crisis. Um, the other thing, and I just alluded to this a little bit that I've heard a lot of people say is this time has been an opportunity to really figure out what their priorities are. And, um, you know, that might be a focus on kindness toward the community. It might be a focus on self-care. It might be a focus on more quiet time and less busy, busy, busy. It might be a focus on, I don't want to be in my car anymore. And I want to, you know, not commute several hours a day so that I can be with my family. Um, it might be a focus on mental health and physical health. Um, it might be a focus on gratitude and spirituality. Like I've heard so many different um, realignments for folks over the last year and a half. And so what I would say about that is even as the world starts to open up more and more and more and more and more, and, um, and we're getting those messages of back to normal, can you hold on to those priorities in the face of um, busyness, you know? Mm -hmm. And so if you, if you want to say no to those events because it actually creates more time in your life to focus on one of those priorities that I just listed, um, that's okay. And so I've heard, you know, from folks like, gosh, I hope the world doesn't go back mm -hmm. to the way that it was before. Um, because there actually has been, there have been some gifts and some silver linings and some opportunity to be more reflective as a species um, so that we can hopefully make the world a better place. I know that might sign, sound idealistic, but I think that there, there are people who are using that line of thinking as they prepare their next steps. Mm -hmm. No, I think that's great. I love the idea of practicing because then it does, it's like you have a dry run before you actually have to do those things. Yeah. And I'm also wondering what do, what are your, what's your personal thought and what would you tell your clients or your own self? At what point do you say, okay, we're going to push outside of our comfort zone because we need to mm -hmm. do that versus no, I'm going to be really protective of that. How do you decipher? Mm -hmm. Because there's certain things we're going to have to return to, whether we like it or not. Yeah. But some things, right. to your point, you don't have to be involved in 50 million activities and you can really just pick mm -hmm. the two or change completely and reframe exactly mm -hmm. what you're spending your time doing. But how do you yourself think about it? And how would you tell kids if it's like, I know you don't want to, but you need to? Mm -hmm. Um, I would, I would give a lot of preparation. Um, we might talk about what the plan is. I mean, in my household, we are constantly talking about what the plan is. Um, and I, I love that my kids will even say that to me now. They will say, okay, mama, what's the plan? Um, and that's, you know, it's true in, in therapy sessions too. You know, we often have a, have a plan, whether we're saying it out loud or, um, or we just sort of are holding, holding space for that in our minds. Um, so having a plan being aware of what the plan is, verbalizing the plan, writing down the plan, um, having a visual schedule um, or a visual plan, super, super helpful. Um, you know, I think that that those that can be really a, a great strategy for when we have to do those things, like go back to school, um, for example, or, you know, get on an airplane, you know, those things that um, maybe in certain circumstances we absolutely have to do. Um, so have a plan. Give yourself some lead time if possible. Have opportunity to talk about what it was like afterwards. So have that reflective opportunity mm. after it's over to sort of evaluate, okay, did that work for us? Does something need to change? Do we need more support? Do we need a different, you know, strategy to kind of deal with that because we're going to have to do it again. Um, and so did it work for us? I think that's, that's really, um, important to do. And then, you know, for, for adults or grown or, or children who still feel a little anxious, you know, I would have conversations about 
how they are safe. Um, or I would encourage them, you know, to do that in their own minds, to have opportunities. Okay, my mom keeps me safe. My grandma keeps me safe. My babysitter keeps me safe. They make good choices for me. Um, and those things are true. My teachers keep me safe. And, you know, in the larger community, you know, you can, you know, say, okay, in general, you know, the public health department, they make good choices. And so I'm going to follow what they're saying because they keep me safe. Um, I also make safe choices for myself, right? I have to trust myself. Um, we, you know, we all do, um, in these situations in reminding ourselves like, Hey, I actually make good choices. Um, and so even if I feel a little anxious about this, have to do um, when I'm re-entering. Um, I, I make good choices for myself, and I've proven that to myself time and time and time again. So I'm going to make a good choice for myself this time too. It's such a good idea to get in that self-talk because we all, it's so important as, as a kid. Mm -hmm. And then again, even using it as an adult, talking ourselves mm -hmm. through some of these right? challenging situations. Yeah. And um Okay, I have one last question for you because I have just, I'm sure you have a really good thought and explanation on this. How do you, because I feel like as we're talking a lot about this, the word anxiety is going to be our word of 2021, 20, mm -hmm. 2022 <laughs> and further, which I think it's important because we all have some aspect of it and we'll have it as part of our life at some point and different mm -hmm. levels. How do you explain to a child what anxiety is mm -hmm. and what it might um, feel like? Yeah, it's, you know, it's a great question. And so with, with little ones, sometimes we don't use the word anxiety. Sometimes mm -hmm. we use the word worries. Um, and, and that resonates a little bit more to, to little kiddos. Um, with, with young children... And again, whether we have children who we're talking to or children who are so little that we're working with the caregivers, um, we want to focus on the feelings in one's body and what the body is doing because the body is really, really expressive when we are feeling anxious and we have worries. And so we can describe a myriad of symptoms and not everyone has every single one. But there's typically something that will resonate for that child or for the caregiver. Um, and then you can kind of go from there with your treatment strategy. So, you know, for some kiddos, we might talk about, you know, your brain is just racing, 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 racing with so many thoughts and you can't ever turn off your brain. Um, does it ever feel like that happens to you? And, and sometimes during the day, for a lot of kiddos, it's at night laying down to sleep. Mm -hmm. I just can't turn off my brain. I just can't turn off my brain. And so that's a very common symptom. Um, sometimes it feels like your body's really shaky, right? And it doesn't look like you're shaking, but it feels like you're shaking. Um, and so that might be, be a way to describe anxiety. Sometimes for certain people, it feels like a burning kind of from their tummy all the way up sometimes into their throat. Um, that could feel like, like anxiety or so many worries. Um, for some people, there are some really concrete somatic symptoms. So the racing heart, sweaty palms, um, poor digestion. And so if you're working with a baby or, or young, um, a toddler, you might see, um, poor digestion, either a lot of spitting up or tummy problems. Um, you know, and, uh, poor sleep would be another really concrete, um, somatic symptom for older children. They might complain, um, you know, my tummy hurts, my tummy hurts. I don't want to go to school. Mm -hmm. Sometimes headaches too. My head hurts. Um, and so, you know, there, that's where the body can just be so useful to us because we have these really palpable, um, symptoms of anxiety when we're experiencing it, we have to listen to it. We have to pay attention to it. You know, whether we're the child or an adult or an adult caregiving for a child, um, those mean something. Um, and so I think that would be, that would be a way we would talk about worries with a kiddo. And then we would talk about what their body feels like so that they can start to make sense of it. They can start to understand I'm not sick, for example, or I'm not crazy. That's another word that I hear a lot. 
lot. Um, or that, that these actually these feelings I should pay attention to instead mm-hmm. of just ignore them and be like, nah, this, 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 I'm okay. It's not a big deal. Right. No, actually you should pay attention to it. Um, and then utilize some of the many coping skills that you and I've talked about today. I absolutely love that for several reasons. And thank you for that because I love that it's a reminder that it doesn't present the same in all of us. So by using one word to try to encompass that, it seems like it's everybody feels this way with this word. And you're right. We're all very Mm -hmm. different. So focusing on Mm -hmm. those symptoms. And I also like the feelings piece of it because then you can start, just like you said, you can start to realize, oh, I'm starting to feel this. I need to do this before it turns into this. So then it's just more of this, oh, okay. I know what happens Mm -hmm. when I initially feel this, I need to do this. And instead of Mm -hmm. waiting for it to be a full blown panic attack, you've, you've, you're staying ahead of it. Yeah, because really, and you and I haven't really touched on this too much, but just briefly, untreated anxiety can lead to really significant problems. Mm -hmm. Um, It can be a full-blown panic attack where, you know, you're passing out and you feel like you're hyperventilating and you can't breathe. And a lot of people end up in the ER for those kinds of things. Um, And then they often feel bad because they're told, well, it's anxiety. And, you know, you feel shame for that. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, for some people, it can lead to hypertension, high blood pressure, um, heart attacks, strokes, um, poor digestion. So acid reflux or, or, um, reflux disease. So, you know, their irritable bowel syndrome. Um, I mean, there are so many, um, symptoms that can be related to, to anger, more significant Mm -hmm. symptoms and, and, and diseases and diagnoses that can be related to untreated anxiety. And so it really does benefit our bodies, um, no matter how old we are to pay attention before it gets to that point, because what happens is our body just keeps getting louder and louder and louder, right? So you're not paying attention to me. And so I'm going to go to this really big place so that I can get the attention that I need right now. Yeah. I love that analogy. That's, 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 I'm seeing this visual. (laughs) Your body's like, Hey, you, (laughs) I'm (laughs) right. So, well, Emily, you are just, I feel like I learned so much from you. I was, I woke up so uh, with a peace knowing I was going to get to spend time with you and <laughs> I cannot wait until I can see you in person again. And uh, I, I have no anxiety about re-entry with you. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. I, we we will navigate our, our first hug yes. with uh, joy. I have a feeling. Yes. Yeah. So thank you so much. Yeah. And I, um, are you, any, any talks or any conferences or anything coming up that people could learn more from you or your website where, because again, I think you're, what you have to say is so valuable, important. Um, anything that you're going to be presenting on in the future on this that people could tune oh. into? Mm-hmm. Well, um, not on this topic specifically, but, um, some of my colleagues that you know, Jennifer, Mm -hmm. um, and I are going to be presenting on um, really the stress and resilience process of um, babies who are born in the NICU Mm -hmm. and the impact on their families at the um, Division of Early Childhood Conference in September. It's a virtual conference. And then um, the Association for... um, pediatric physical therapists at that conference as well in November of this year. And so that's what, and that's virtual too. Um, so no travel involved this year and they're, they're easy to find on the, the various, um, association websites. Um, but I'm sure there are lots and lots of really interesting topics, um, at those conferences, if any of your listeners are interested. Yeah. And we'll um, put the, those um, in the show notes as well. So people, because I've heard you speak and it's wonderful and it's, I've always learned from you. So Emily, thank you so much for your time and your wisdom and um, stay well. Thank you, Jennifer. Thanks so much. And that wraps up this episode. Thank you for tuning into SLP Full Disclosure. For more information about this episode, check out the show notes on our website at medtravelers.com slash SLP Full Disclosure. And don't forget to leave us a review and subscribe so you never miss a guest. 
Are you interested in becoming a Trouble SLP? Visit medtravelers.com to learn more and explore the exciting opportunities we offer at top level facilities across the country. Also, a special thanks to Jonathan Carey for producing this episode and Aiden Dykes for the music and editing. And as always, this episode was powered by Med Travelers. See you next time. Bye.